uh, you see now, like it's on uh, eyes may look, but it's the brain that sees. So we'll be in this IC. We'll be talking about the base basics of amblyopia with all the new vision therapies. And my co-speakers uh, are Dr. Kaushik Murli and uh, Dr. Murli there and Sandra. They will be joining soon. So we'll st start with Dr. Kaushik Murli from Shankara Eye Center, Bangalore. He'll be talking on the home and office-based treatment options in amblyopia. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge some of my colleagues, uh, Namrata, Aditya, and Nikita from our College of Optometry, who helped me in putting together some aspects of this presentation. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about home and office-based therapy for amblyopia. When you look at amblyopia, we know that it is characterized by various uh, functional vision abnormalities, reduced visual acuity, uh, contrast vision is lost, vernier acuity is lost. There also is some amount of distortions in terms of how the spatial orientation is. So what we would crudely talk about the hand-eye coordination or the uh, knowledge of the environment that we are in. In addition to that, we know that they also suffer from binocular abnormalities such as impaired stereo acuity and impaired uh, abnormal binocular summation. Now the gold standard of treatment has actually been occlusion therapy, which looks at improvement of monocular visual acuity and the premise is that at some stage, hopefully the brain will relearn the binocular functions by itself and that somehow does not seem completely okay. Uh, when you look at home therapy, the most uh, commonly used or the most widely used one continues to be occlusion. Today we do follow the PEDIC protocols in terms of understanding how many hours of occlusion is required. But again, you could include some amount of activity in this. So essentially here what we try to do is we ask the child to circle out one alphabet. You could use a newspaper here. We've used a printout, but you could even use a simple newspaper and ask them just to kind of circle out one alphabet. So that kind of keeps the child engaged. It also makes them use their eyes and it becomes a great activity. It's at least something fun that they're doing. So this probably is the crudest form of home therapy that we can do. It also kind of enhances some amount of compliance. Uh, however, when you look at occlusion and all of it, we've seen that even responders to occlusion therapy have residual amblyopia. 54% uh, of children have some amount of amblyopia even if they were treated young. And most of them, even on a long-term follow-up, have it. Compliance, of course, is very less. Even the outcomes are not that great when you're looking at children that are a little older. And this is from literature from some time back. Occlusion, again, has this challenge in that it's a very difficult experience, not just for the child, but also for the parents. And they do acknowledge that there is some amount of difficulty as well as psychosocial impact that they undergo. Uh, we did a small survey trying to understand what is it that they do. So when you looked at uh, compliance, uh, we had almost about two thirds of them being compliant. So they were prescribed to it. Then when we asked them saying that, what do you do? So typically when you're occluding, you ask them to wear glasses over the patch. But we, were sub we found it very surprising that almost about 10% of them uh, did not wear their glasses or kind of wore it whenever they wanted. Uh, again, we had a small set of children who actually occluded their eyes when they were even sleeping. So obviously both the children, nor more importantly, the parent did not understand what the whole treatment regimen was. And when we asked them, almost uh, very few of them actually said it was easy to do. Most of them were undecided, which means they were politely telling us that you've made our life difficult and a small percentage were very outright with it. So a variety of alternates have been looked at, uh, right from atropine penalization to using certain filters to using devices uh, that have shown some amount of improvement in visual acuity and something beyond that also. Uh, so in terms of, uh, again, I'll show you some of these. Some have used videos, some have used games, some have used uh, Tetris that we're used to doing it. but. By and large, when you look at vision therapy, you're trying to assist the treating binocular dysfunction. It reduces the overall uh, therapy time and it actually does make occlusion effective. So even if you're diffident about starting it on your own, then it does do it. And what the entire premise of it is that the depth of amblyopia is correlated to the binocular imbalance. And there is some amount of binocular cortical communication that does persist in subjects with amblyopia. 
So again, this functions on what is called as a dichoptic principle. So here, again, the dominant tie gets a much uh, more low contrast kind of a stimulus and therefore you're trying to make the brain kind of use that eye a little bit more to kind of uh, make it easier for you. So say, imagine the eye that is on the blue is the sound eye that would get a much lower contrast. And then you gradually keep increasing it uh, over a period of time so that it becomes equal. So as the therapy enhances, the contrast also keeps improving and that's how you do it. So our early start with vision therapy was with a system called as the home therapy system. This used to be imported in from the US. Uh, we found it had multiple activities that the child could do and we did see improvement as early as from three months of using this as a therapy. And our fundamental question was, was there a more effective and an efficient way to then patching or even using any of the drugs that were there. So this is the Tetris that I had shared earlier where they said that only one quarter of the children completed the treatment type because they found it boring. Because again, finding one hour to do this in a, on multiple days a week was again something that they found was not really possible. Uh, over a period of time, we've developed our own system partnering with a technology company based out of Chennai. Uh, this is a system that uses multiple ways of stimulating. It is based on both the dichoptic and as well as the synoptic principle. Uh, this is a study that we published in 29 adult subjects between 18 to 40 years with anisometropic amblyopia. And we found that even if people were not completely compliant, that is they didn't do the activity for the prescribed amount of time, we did still find a significant amount of improvement in it. And a lot of them also had a significant gain in stereopsis. So, both those happened with all of these subjects. We then looked at it saying that how aware are uh, practitioners uh, willing to look at it, uh, both among patients and practitioners we looked at it. Uh, so we found that only 35% were compliant to conventional treatment and they didn't think there was only 3% felt there was nothing more important. Uh, those who were using binocular vision therapy, almost 55% felt that there was an improvement in it. So. Why is it then that we can't do it home? The advantage with any of these home therapy systems are they're web-based. So you just share a link that the software is accessed by them over the internet and they can do this. So that is the beauty of this entire system. However, then why aren't 100% of our patients on it? Again, there is some amount of boredom that sets in. And what we've also realized is that the parents need to understand. We've found instances where the grandfather or the grandmother was doing the activity on behalf of the child the child had made it seem as though it was homework. So like they would help the child with the homework, the grandfather was helping them with these exercises. So we found on the system significant improvement, but when the child walked into the clinic, we didn't see any improvement at all. So we find that this awareness becomes important. And again, there are multiple other facets that we can work on using multiple devices when they are in office. So for example, you can look at uh, working on the monocular fixation in a binocular kind of a field where you have very similar, so you ask them to look it. They wear a basic red and blue glass so that you stimulate the eye that is not uh, very clear. And you ask them to click on certain activities. So they're moving their head, they're tracking, they're doing multiple other things. Uh, this again is something that has been tried earlier where you just stick on a red and green filter and use again the dichoptic principle to try and see how you can stimulate it. It is supposed to be helping as an anti-suppression kind of a therapy. Uh, again, there are multiple things that can be done using this. So here again, uh, the child is wearing the glass. They're supposed to be catching the falling thing. So it's some kind of a gamification that happens and it involves some amount of understanding. So you can't have a very naive child play it, but we've had children as young as uh, four being able to enable it. So today children are a lot more tech savvy. Over and above that, you can also use certain bar readers. You can use a pegboard. All these options are available when they come into the clinic. So it makes it a little more fun. Uh, so again, I'm just showing some of these videos because it's not very complex or complicated. It is what we would logically think would be required. Here again, you're using a base in, base out kind of a thing to improve the stereopsis. Uh, COVID was a blessing in disguise because uh, patients were unable to walk into our clinic and it was at that point in time we evolved to a system of what we call as a supervised home therapy. So here again, we this shows our uh, optometrist in the clinic sitting in uh, getting looking at the patient's computer screen and then they actually access into our system so there is no privacy issue to them 
and we've isolated this particular system from the rest of the hospital network. So they are proactively changing the settings on the patient's system. The patient is at home and automatically she can then see what is happening and then guide it on to that. So this becomes something very effective. We've done a small study where we looked at about 406 patients, apologies for the error. Uh, again, we first looked at it saying that, is it possible to even evaluate it? We found that uh, stereo acuity, both in clinic as well as when you do it as a remote assessment matched very well. Uh, when you look at uh, visual acuity measurements, again, that had a very good match. Uh, when you look at tri equity, which is your right eye, left eye and the binocular vision equity, even that matched very well. So full-fledged evaluation theoretically can be done even remote, you don't need the child to come in. Uh, even looking at phorias, uh, both horizontal and vertical, even those measurements were possible. Uh, we were also able to measure the suppression scotoma because that is of our interest in terms of improving it. Uh, when we looked at uh, efficacy of treatment, again compliance was kind of equal. Uh, and treatment could be done in a much better way. So this kind of does not allow the child to do what they're doing, but there is some amount of supervision that is there. So with home therapy, the big advantage is it can be done at the patient's convenience. There is no time constraint. The disadvantage, of course, is that we don't know how many times they're unlikely to come back for a follow-up periodically. They need an appropriate setup. So today having a laptop, having Wi-Fi connection is not still penetrated across. There is a high chance of discontinuation and then you're dependent only on the software actually performing whatever you want to do. In office, the therapy is given under supervision of experts. There is less chance of bias. You can actually track the progress. The compliance is better because while they're in office, they're also interacting with other patients who are doing the same therapy. And when the others tell them, you know what, my vision improved, these people are more likely to be doing it. Disadvantage, of course, is it is difficult. It takes away time from both the child and the parents and it becomes expensive. Supervised remote assist therapy becomes kind of an in-between. The therapy is given under subject experts on an online session. There is no time constraint because it is online. Disadvantage continues to be largely technology related with connectivity. And there is a possibility of schedules of the children changing with the multiple activities that they do. And the limitation again is that you're dependent only on a software based therapy. Long story short, I think we need to evolve. So this is how esotropia used to be treated early. I think we need to move on to look at more recent changes and adapt to the changing needs not just of our needs, but also to our patients' needs, so that we can restore vision effectively. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Kaushik Murli. That was, he has extensively covered all the options for uh, amblyopia management. Any questions to Dr. Murli? Because he'll be leaving the, for another session. Can you use a synaptophore for amblyopia treatment with with Playopix and how to use it and any recommendations? So we did, earlier that used to be the only option. So that used to be something that was being done. But uh, the disadvantage with that is again, the limitation in terms of the cards, the cards fade out and it's, it's, it's a little boring for the child. So because it's a very monotonous task, you want them to do that day in, day out. So that really, we don't know if it works. With Playoptics, it's again, uh, we're not very sure if it works, how it works. There are publications that support that it works. There are equal number of publications that say it doesn't work. Uh, today, they do use a lot of light in terms of syntonics. Again, publications are there, but just that alone may not work. So we had a patient who came in. He wanted something to be done. We tried to play. He was around 24 years, and his vision improved from 618 to 69 over a period of 10 days. So. Uh, challenge comes in terms of how long does it remain? So is it an incidental yeah. uh, improvement or are you able to sustain it becomes a problem. So even with patching, we know that 30% of them may have some amount of regression. So you want something that can be persistent. Sorry, I missed the first part of the talk, but you do this without any patching at all, is it? Ma'am. No patching or do you combine the therapy with patching? So that is the fight between us ophthalmologists and the optometrists. The oh. optometrists believe that uh, this can be used as primary therapy. Uh, one of our postgraduates did this as a thesis dissertation. That's why we published it in older anisometropes because again there we were sure that they would not patch and we found them improve. So today the trade-off is if you're sure that the child is going to use it, we use it or we just get a small spike in terms of the visual acuity because they want to see an improvement. Like Sir mentioned, 10 days they see improvement, they're more likely to persist. So today we use it as an add-on to occlusion therapy. Uh, Again, cost is a deterrent. So you do advise patching and along with that? You 
Yes, sir. Cost to the patient, it depends, sir. Depends. There are multiple systems that are available in the market. We don't have any financial interest in the system that uh, I've shown here. But there are multiple options available. Most of them work on a SaaS model. So it is a paper use kind of a model. All of them are web based systems. So it, the cost is as well as you can negotiate. So, how long do you continue this? Because you said regression is an issue. Yeah. When would you say stop it? Well, typically, this has about 120 runs. So, it's about four months of therapy. You call them back and then look at it. And then you continue it on a maintenance kind of a therapy if required for up to a year, year and a half. But we found improvement in about two to three months. Any other questions to Dr. Kaushik? So let's move to our next speaker, Dr. Murlidhar. He'll be talking on the binocular vision therapy in Amblyopia, a novel approach. Now over to Murlidhar. Uh, sincere thanks to Dr. Aruna for having me here and for all those who decided to stick around with us till this time. So I'll be talking on dicoptic therapy. So uh, at the outset, let me just say that uh, dicoptic, uh, dicoptics is not here to replace patching. It's possibly here only to supplement patching. And an extensive trial of dicoptics uh, done by the PIDIC group has shown that dicoptics is not superior to patching really. So we are not looking uh, to replacing patching. We are rather looking to supplement uh, patching. So dicoptics essentially involves splitting the game into two parts. One seen by the uh, dominant eye and one seen by the amblyopic eye. And then you have to integrate the two to play the game. So it was originally conceived that uh, this would be a more fun way of treating amblyopia. Uh, but it has not stood out its promise and uh, the dicoptics currently available in the market are fairly expensive. For a one month, some of them, uh, the Binox charges 13,800 and uh, some of them entirely miss the bus on dicoptics. Okay, so uh, uh, the need is because uh, that 3 to 5 percent of uh, uh, the general population is amblyopic, and patching has been the mainstay of therapy, continues to be the mainstay of therapy for over 200 years. The issues, however, why we have started to look at other this thing is there are issues with compliance, and uh, 54 percent in 3 to 7 year age group and 74 percent they continue to have some residual deficits, whether it is in motion processing or in visual snell and equity or contrast sensitivity, they continue to have some residual defects. And uh, there are n number of issues with compliance in these uh, children. So again, uh, it is not very effective in adults. Up to 17 years, it can be uh, tried uh, if patching has not been tried and it has not failed before. But the problem is uh, that even then, the success rate is not that great, 25 percent or so. And there can be recurrence once patching is started. And uh, there were concerns that because patching uh, essentially shuts out one eye, so there could be issues with stereopsis. So in addition, again I repeat it is in addition, is because the dicoptics uh, was said to allow persistent binocular com uh, communication and some kind of plasticity persists into adulthood. Adults who have lost one eye uh, because of some unfortunate reason, especially the good eye, they have sustained improvement in the amblyopic eye. And some reduction in lateral inhibition which is the uh, principle of the perceptual vision and uh, two new approaches that may work, they include uh, perceptual learning which is performance of a task again and again these are the uh, commercially available perceptual learning gabo patch dissection detection positional discrimination letter identification and noise different companies have come up with different things and um, the same thing is administered to both eye. In dicoptics, you split the stimulus into two halves to integrate. In perceptual learning, the same is administered to both eyes simultaneously or under monocular viewing conditions. So this was a Gabbard patch. This I have borrowed from the perceptual uh, uh, vision that is uh, revital vision. So it was said to uh, have maximal stimulation and uh, they said that Gabo patch, uh, two Gabo patches placed side by side to the middle. It actually stimulated the ocular dominance columns in the cat uh, visual cortex. And in fact, if you see even the uh, black and white patches, they are uh, based on the hubel weasel theory. And it is said that this lateral inhibition, which modulates the uh, lateral, uh, lateral inhibition, which modulates the neural response, it is reduced by this Gabo patch detection. There's a lot of signs into it. For us, I mean, uh, you can just say that uh, it's essentially a game based on the Gabo patches and uh, they charge sizably for the charge bomb for uh, giving us this Gabo patch and it is said to work again it is a supplement so the same stimulus at the same time is presented to both eyes it can also be done monocularly and it is said to uh, I mean these are the theories that are claimed by revital vision and whether uh, it works or not 
uh, some improvement is definitely there. Sometimes even in refractory amblyopia where you have patched them for six months and the improvement has leveled off, uh, it's not moving beyond that. For them, we have tried this and uh, in some patients it has worked. Uh, again, uh, let's not get carried away by the tall claims made by any company for that matter. So in dichoptic training, it's an independent stimulus to both eyes and these two are integrated. So what you can modulate here is you can reduce the contrast uh, given to the amblyopic eye to excise the same or you can reduce the uh, contrast given to the dominant eye to uh, in the initial stages so that the amblyopic eye gets favored. So based on the individual assessment, uh, you could uh, you can play around because it's after all a computer game. So the problem with dichoptics uh, over perceptual learning is that if there is a manifest strabismus that has to be corrected first, either by surgery or by prisms or whatever and uh, if there is if it is micro strabismus you may not have a very great outcome because in that case uh, you have an extra foveal point that is uh, fixing and if eccentric fixation none of these work actually but there uh, I mean somebody was mentioning about the sign of the four there the heading of brushes can be tried because heading of brushes can only be seen by the uh, fovea but that's not the topic of this so the strategy is that uh, you can have an immersive game play. It may be immersive to adults, but uh, I think kids get bored very fast with that. So you need the parent to uh, be around with that. It could be passive viewing or uh, passive viewing of a TV screen. These are the various strategies. So passive viewing of a uh, TV screen, which is integrated either by Polaroid filters or by or by uh, anaglyph red green or red blue glasses or virtual reality glasses or shutter glasses that in between they shut out one eye. Uh, they shut out one eye when the child is performing a game or passively viewing a, a TV monitor that can only be integrated by this thing. So this is the uh, this is what the Binox says and uh, it uses red uh, blue stimulus and red blue glasses. There is no option to reduce the contrast in this. Uh, so they say that the dominant eye, the red uh, is lesser contrast, but there is no way to reduce the contrast in that. You have to match uh, the two together and they are uh, integrated in the occipital cortex that is said to uh, improve the stereopsis as well as improve uh, vision in the uh, vision in the size. So they have various game strategies. They have various game, uh, game strategies, the super squad and uh, super coin catch and this and that just to keep the child engaged. And this is how you calibrate the screen. Uh, the I mean getting it working is very easy because it is done on a computer monitor. It cannot be done on a mobile phone on a computer monitor uh, and uh, patients can be guided over the uh, on the go uh, over the internet uh, as to how to calibrate. Basically these two have to be made equally and uh, then you also have to orient the two halves of the coin uh, such that they are uh, brought together and they overlap. So and then you are good to go, uh, play the games and uh, it also has a basic assessment, it could assess your vision, it could assess uh, you know this thing. So these are some of the games, you play it with the red blue glass, anaglyph glass. So essentially if the child wears the glass, so he, can, he or she can play the game only with both eyes uh, put together. They say put the red over the dominant eye for some reason and uh, Yeah, so fairly simple uh, games. So younger children again may be interested with this, older children um, may get bored. So the flip side is if the child decides to take off the glasses and is not under supervision, this can be played by anyone even otherwise. Yeah, so the other uh, thing is uh, now that virtual reality is catching up. So we have this BV software which we have installed at our hospital and uh, the disadvantage is the patient has to come to the hospital for these sittings. And then again, it's all uh, some. Uh, it's all uh, just a virtual reality game. So here you have many options. Uh, here you have many options and many games. And uh, you only need a computer, and you need to connect this virtual reality headset, which comes for a very fat price. So you can uh, play around here. You can uh, say that the background will be seen only by the uh, dominant eye. You can have the peripheral stimulant on. You can shut out one eye, or you can blur the dominant eye. That option is also there. You can have the target with one eye and the pointer with the other eye. Uh, I mean, this could go on and on. There is no saying which is which one approach is superior to the other. But essentially, um, this one ensures that uh, you can, you know, you separate the two eyes and then you uh, get the game uh, going. So. Uh, so this is a simple uh, this thing now uh, that. This pointer is seen in one eye. After some time, you could shut out the pointer in one eye. Now, the pointer is not seen in this eye. You can even alternate uh, for intermittent divergence squint. You can keep alternating uh, the two. 
so the key point which i want to emphasize is these games are not really rocket science and uh, can be designed by anyone with some knowledge in uh, computer and in fact there is a, a free uh, dig rush game that is available on the play store and you can uh, have the patient procure a red green glass and get them going so you can blur the dominant eye you can reduce the contrast in the dominant eye uh, yeah that's how you do it so essentially involves a lot of playing around the company guides of course depending on the vision the fixation uh, it, this thing can also be done monocularly the whole game can be shifted monocularly and you can have a cyber patching for one eye so the advantage of the virtual you are using the virtual reality is even if the patient has a manifest strabismus with some amount of binocularity you can uh, have a virtual prism uh, going so that is the advantage with 3d goggles but all this comes for a very hefty price so uh, i mean if someone is really computer savvy uh, i think he or she can design their own game this game doesn't really require too much of an intelligence and can be designed by anyone for a fraction of the cost at which they are uh, they are being sold so again the digrash game is available on the app store, on the play store and the app store itunes also and uh, can be accessed by anyone it's a free game uh, again the same dichotomic principle the problem with that is that you have to correct any manifest strabismus if you are able to design a game see note here the uh, uh, pointer is alternating between the two eyes you can have the background only for one eye you can have the target only for one eye depending on the vision you could uh, choose it and again i think anybody could design this uh, game so just wanted to present a case scenario so this was a, a 16 year old with a manifest uh, dvd in one eye so i operated uh, this patient and uh, uh, gave her these dichotomic exercise so post strabismus surgery and dichotomics this was 612 patient essentially had a refractive a refractory amblyopia uh, she was optimally corrected and uh, we just uh, tried this 612 have followed her up for almost uh, uh, you know 6 months the benefit has been sustained so these are various studies that uh, show all these kind of benefits uh, but remember um, that uh, pedic has not reported very encouraging results they did not show any difference in stereopsis also so i would uh, conclude by saying that uh, they did not show any uh, encouraging results in that uh, it is not that the dichotomic doesn't work but it is not superior to patching and uh, the other thing is the binocularity was also not superior to the patching group they had one group that had dichotics and they had the other group that were trying patching and uh, the results really were um, comparable with the patching group doing better so i would say dichotics is not for all even though the companies try to hard sell it at a, a premium price so the price is really really premium and uh, i don't think it should be that expensive so uh, all those all of us who are tech savvy i think we should be able to design our own game and all of those uh, like me who are lazy we can use the binocular digrash uh, uh, game that is available free on the itunes and the uh, app store get a red blue red green glass and get going with it so again uh, it was never never ever meant to uh, replace patching it is not possible patching continues to remain and uh, dichotics with virtual reality it allows for innovation you can even incorporate virtual prisms in that for those who manifest uh, strabismus but remember glasses and patching are the mainstay and uh, this is uh, an option for those looking for a, for that little uh, you know extra and maybe it can be tried for refractory amblyopia so with no guarantee that it is going to uh, work thank you dr murlidhar that was a nice presentation with a lot of interesting videos so talking on amblyopia treatment in adults how it's been possible so we'll discuss all the possible options for them so i have no financial disclosures and when we come uh, when we think of treating adult amblyops the main thing we have to uh, talk about is the neuroplasticity because it underpins the basis for all uh, therapies and perceptual learning or uh, rehab or whatever in adult amblyops so what is neuroplasticity it's our brain's ability to change and adapt there is a structural plasticity where our experiences or memories can change a brain's physical structure and there is a functional plasticity where uh, do repeated uh, tasks or therapies the brain functions move from a damaged area to an undamaged area and uh, earlier as we all know the uh, neuroplasticity was limited to within the critical period of visual development which was some uh, from birth to 8 years of age and so uh, the therapies for amblyopia was only limited to children and when we see an adult amblyop we didn't have any other options 
except uh, telling them it's a, like the prognosis is not so good. But with advanced uh, neuro researchers, uh, sciences, uh, there, is, there are a lot of newer insights and uh, it's proved that neuroplasticity does extend beyond critical visual period and we can rewire the brain with, uh, with uh, all the possible options. So then came the advanced uh, new technologies and uh, newer vision therapies came into these newer vision therapies, as uh, my earlier speakers were talking, were based on two learning concepts. One is the perceptual learning and uh, dichotomic anti-suppression training. So perceptual uh, visual learning is uh, nothing but if you repeatedly practice a challenging visual task, it can lead to substantial and enduring improvements in the perform visual performance over time. And uh, it reflects our learning and plasticity in the visual system as well as a network of neuronal connections. So, dichotomic anti-suppression training, uh, which was extensively covered by Dr. Murli, it's a new therapeutic approach which employs uh, simultaneous and uh, separate uh, stimulation of both types, eyes, and it's called as dichotomic. Uh, it's done with uh, anaglyph glasses, so the, where the contrast for the good eye is reduced. Uh, it aims as a balance with the amblyopic eye. So this is based on the binocular theory that amblyopia is a binocular interaction and uh, suppression is a key element in the amblyopic eye. So before going to all these uh, therapies, a comprehensive eye evaluation is something which has to be done. Uh, uh, visual acuity or refraction, a complete optical correction has to be given and contrast sensitivity, of course, we can assess with Pelly Robinson or any other methods we have and a complete uh, motor and sensory evaluation with an ear stereopsis and uh, slit lamp examination or to rule out all the anterior segment and uh, fundus pathologies. And uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Murli was telling, foveal fixation is something which is uh, uh, mandatory for some uh, binocular vision therapy. So we have, if we just remember, we have to correct any manifest uh, strabismus or any other factors which um, when there is no foveal fixation, it can be done either with visuoscope or with uh, OCT. Uh, OCT will also guide us. Um, uh, some uh, therapy like uh, perceptual learning, uh, it works for some uh, organic amblyops. We can at least give a try for them. So in such cases, uh, OCT will help us to assess how much the ganglion cell layer losses. And uh, even if they have some amount of uh, foveal fixation, we can give a trial of this uh, therapy. So diopsis is another uh, supplementary tool which we can use to assess the visual pathways and to assess the prognosis and for uh, the follow-up of the patient. And this um, amblyopia identification protocol as per the uh, ERG and VEPs, there should be a nine millisecond difference in latency in at least two spatial frequencies between the eyes. There are five spatial frequencies done here with different target uh, size and uh, contrast and uh, there should be 9 millisecond difference or there should be a 25 percent reduction or a 60 percent reduction in amplitude if it is a severe amblyop to grade them as an amblyop. So this is one of my patient with a left eye, uh, she had a post cataract surgery and um, she had a left eye sensory deprivation amblyopia and you can see her ERG, that it's showing a 9 millisecond difference in latency and a 25 to 30% reduction in amplitude in two spatial frequencies. So coming to the software options, uh, Revital Vision is the only software now available to based on the perceptual learning program. As Dr. Murli was telling, it is based on the Gabber patches. So it is, uh, it's uh, based on the Gabber patches where uh, there are various difficulty tasks are given based on a single triple image and they have a target uh, uh, Gabber uh, image with a flanker and the patient is uh, made to play. As he was uh, telling, it can be done both minor, usually it is done monocularly by patching one eye, but sometimes it does uh, work in binocular viewing conditions also. But usually perceptual learning is done with patching of the good eye and the patient, the, uh, patient is made to play the tasks at, and as the threshold levels increase, they are giving a challenging task to improve their uh, threshold. So I had done a case study with 10 patients uh, uh, with the age group of 18 to 52 and uh, I, 
most of them were functional amblyops, I, uh, but uh, there were uh, three organic amblyops also. The prerequisites for therapy were done, and a few completed uh, the therapy, and uh, few are ongoing. So Revital Vision says that at least a minimum 40 session therapy ha has to be done within a period of three months. And it again, it can be customized or uh, the sessions can be increased as per uh, the needs. So the uh, discarded visual acuity was assessed with Snellen and Logmar and stereopsis with the TNO test uh, ran out for a year was done and these were the pre and post therapy results. And uh, contrast sensitivity was assessed uh, using a Pelly Robinson chart. And the, the last two patients are still ongoing the therapy. I had uh, done uh, revital therapy for uh, three patients, uh, 50, uh, organic amblyops, a 53-year-old uh, uh, female who had a macular dystrophy with a 6x60 um, uh, vision in both eyes. Uh, but her um, uh, post-therapy, her vision in right eye improved by one line because uh, in that eye, uh, she had a, a less amount of this uh, severity of the problem. So the, uh, my case too was a 40 year old male. Uh, he had a toxo scar and his uh, uh, visual acuity with 618 in the right eye and 624 parts in the left eye. And uh, this patient was keen in giving a try of revital therapy and he's uh, completed uh, 40 sessions. He said to come for follow up. This case three is again another inter interesting case and mine being a glaucoma center too. Uh, we, had a, we have a 19 year old who has been operated on, um, soon after birth for congenital glaucoma, but she has lost one eye. She's a one eyed patient with a 5 by 60 vision in the left eye. And um, she was also keen in giving it a try. We have uh, advised revital therapy, uh, but we have also ex explained to her the pros and cons and uh, the prognosis part. And uh, she's still on the therapy. The only thing uh, which we found in this uh, patient is she was she's not able to move to the next next level of difficulty task because of her uh, vision. And she's still uh, undergoing the therapy. Maybe in, uh, we have to wait and watch. So, uh, so in our study, it showed a 1.5 line improvement on the eye chart in functional amblyops. But one patient who had a sensory deprivation amblyopia, she didn't have much of improvement and uh, we have stopped the therapy. Contrast sensitivity in our study group showed improvement in few cases, but uh, stereopsis did not show any significant uh, improvement with uh, revital vision. The, as per the revital vision clinical studies, uh, they have demonstrated that the vision improvement gained with 20 hours of this therapy was equivalent to 500 hours of patching in children. And the average improvement is 2.5 lines on the eye chart and 100% uh, in contrast sensitivity. And they also claim it improves stereo and binocular functions. Um, we have to, since our sample size is too small, we have to uh, do studies with a larger sample size to come to a concrete conclusion. So the other option, as Dr. Kaushik was discussing, this Vishwa Prime is a software which is based on dichoptic anti-suppression training uh, done by Shankara I team. And uh, this, they have a lot of this uh, professional and a home-based edition. And uh, it, it has a lot of programs like um, anti-suppression program, stereopsis uh, program, monocular and binocular field of vision, monocular therapy, accommodation, and so on. So this is one of my staff. She's a 48-year-old female. Uh, she's an aniso hyperopic amblyopian right eye. And uh, she's ongoing this uh, Vishwa Prime therapy. And um, she is... Um, She's uh, completed two weeks of therapy and uh, she's still continuing. She has... Uh, these are the programs which are available. And um, she's... Uh, there are a lot of uh, games like this, monocular, and she's uh, playing the therapy in our, it's a professional uh, edition of it in our hospital and she's uh, is much happy because she's shown one line of improvement in two weeks and uh, she's still continuing the therapy my case too is a 17 year old female and i saw myopic amblyopia and right eye so high myopic with a uh, with a uh, cl her vision was 6 by 36 and right eye suppression was there with a gross stereopsis uh, she has uh, she's also undergoing the visual prime therapy and uh, she has uh, completed 10 sessions and shows a little bit of improvement. Anyway, she's still continuing the therapy. Binox uh, is another new generation. It's a cloud-based software. It's a user-friendly software, and it can be used both as a clinic or home-based uh, option. It's again based on uh, 
you are telling it's based on the principle of dichoptic therapy and the patient is made to play games on a software with both eyes open and wearing uh, an glove glasses uh, to uh, for the uh, binocularity and pharmacological this just a word to mention there are a lot of uh, studies on oral levodopa and carbidopa acetylcholine sometimes these can be combined with all these newer vision therapies but uh, you have to see what the results are. The future insights are the transcranial stimulation, which is a non-invasive stimulation where the electromagnetic coil is placed against the scalp, creates a magnetic field and it stimulates certain areas of the brain. This is something which is uh, under research going to come in the future. So the take home message will be use of new technology and understanding of the neural basis of amblyopia promises better cures for adult amblyops, uh, but there is a lot of ex uh, things uh, which we have to explore uh, still it's going on and this software based therapies we have to see how it works and we i think we have to customize for each patient and, uh, and uh, uh, prior to administering these therapies the most important is we have to tell the pros and cons for this patient and what to expect from this and what not to expect and, um, and we have to uh, take the guidelines and what are the possible uh, for Indian scenarios how it works because as um, my previous speakers were telling there is a, a cost effectiveness everything has to be discussed with uh, before uh, taking these therapies thank you thanks for Yeah, but Dr. Murli has already uh, shown that Anaglyph glass is nothing but it's uh, uh, the red and blue glasses. So it's just you have to put it over your glasses. If you have uh, glasses, you have to wear it on the glass. Or, yeah, the red is for amblyopica. It increases the contrast. It's like, for, yeah, depends on. And adjusting the contrast for that, you yeah, that uh, adjusting the contrast is not done on the glasses, but these uh, uh, people, the, yeah, they actually while installing, they take the visual acuity, all these things, and then uh, they get a pre uh, request, and then they install the software as per the, for each patient, they, yes, it is done. Speaker, co speaker is uh, Dr. Sandra. I think she's yet to come. So she's another session. She'll be talk, talking more on Binox if uh, uh, we can wait for the. Uh, she's another session. So, any other questions uh, for any anything for Dr. Morali or, or myself? Patching working, right? Patching. No, I, patching again, no, we have not uh, not tried patching in co combination with all these things. I, the patching, as we all know, it is, uh, we have to, it's uh, like, it has its own limitations and uh, it is like um, boring for the kids and even for the adults, I think. I think we should uh, go for this software-based uh, therapy. This Gabber patch is something uh, which is done with patching also. So I think the difficulty task can be adjusted according to the visual threshold. And uh, that will be something very useful to for training our brain neuroplasticity. As our uh, threshold increases, the, the, the task, uh, the challenging tasks get more difficult. So I think it's a better way to treat uh, adult amblyops. What's the cost of the software, uh, the cost for the session? Yeah, the, uh, different uh, for revital vision you're asking? Uh, basic no each software has their own thing that's a visua prime and uh, binox they also have some professional edition where you can install in the hospital hospital with a maybe a minimum cost so you can what give yeah i uh, no, it's, it is in thousands it's in thousands but for uh, it's it's somewhere around 20000 or for each patient somewhere around that softwares yeah for the 40 sessions they usually give for 40 sessions or vishwa uh, prime as dr kaushik was telling they give for 4 months they just give for 30 minutes a day they give like credit points uh, which is like 4500 minutes it comes to somewhere for close to 4 months the company is building for the session not for the software the, the company actually we uh, hospitals we have to get it from the company and we actually give it to our uh, once we uh, uh, what are the purchase costs of the software 
and what is the cost for each session that we give to the patient no it's not for each session you get uh, the if we get a software they give credit points once you get you install it it will be lasting for 40 sessions like that it's not for each session we are giving it's for the total number of sessions it comes somewhere around uh, 20000 something like that should be yeah 13400 something to the hospital yes the basic requirement yeah you should all these are computer uh, based therapies they, we need a 16 inch minimum screen to play all this yeah so it comes somewhere around 13.5 and revital comes where somewhere around 17000 and visual prime somewhere around 15000 No, the software is. This is like the patient. Cloud based. Yeah, it's a cloud based. Yeah. No, no. This this seventeen and fifteen. What we are talking is a license for each patient. You you are getting a license for each patient. That's the cost for. for which we are getting and we can of course uh, we can maybe we can yeah the each each license is for that patient one patient but there is a professional edition in vishwa prime and all like the it might work out uh, if the patient is somewhere nearby you can uh, call them every day and then it can be done as a office based therapy there we can cut down the cost uh, for the patient as well as uh, we can give uh, multiple uh, therapies with that Time restriction for a patient is usually restricted to twenty to thirty minutes. Thirty minutes per day. Yeah. yeah no, that is for one month. They, they give the license every Sunday off, and uh, if you want for binocs, you can give a complimentary extension of one month. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. they do give even revital uh, therapy. They do give us a, a complimentary session, ten sessions or so. They do give that. The VR headset, which I showed, it is only the headset and the software. It costs you one point three eight lakhs for one year. So, and then you have to bill the patient, and you have to rec recover the cost. But this uh, Revital is a US-based uh, software, so there is one limitation with that. Right now, they are not; uh, they are coming up with the annual li annual licenses. They are uh, Revital says that we have to get an annual license. It's a huge cost we have to pay. and then we have to get it for a year or so they are not um, i think they are going to stop their individual licenses and uh, this binox which license they are uh, 34 for 30400 or something they, it is only valid in india so if you have a patient who visits us, yeah it's only valid yes so the minute you cross indian border uh, the yeah. stop work yes if it's in singapore or somewhere we have to yeah it's thousand dollars yeah it it's their uh, yeah that's huge for a patient whom we see and they go back to I mean, cross the overseas, then it is it's a huge cost. Yes. That's what I was saying. I mean, uh, the other IT uh, patients they keep saying that this is prohibitively uh, expensive, whereas the apps that are available in Play Store they are much more complex. And they, uh, even if they charge it for a lifetime license. Yeah, I think that should uh, for our scenarios. Uh, yeah, that should work well. Doctor Sandra is here. She is from uh, Arvind Rai Hospital. She'll be talking on. Uh, so at the outset, I would like to thank uh, AOC and uh, Dr. Aruna uh, for uh, the kind invitation. And uh, so this IC is quite uh, good as it <coughs> talks about all the recent advances in the therapy of amblyopia. And I am going to talk about fun ways to treat uh, amblyopia in kids. It may be actually coinciding with some of what the previous presenters have already spoken on, and I was caught in another talk. So uh, excuse me for that. i do not have any financial interest so the first step that you have to remember is um, that uh, you have to give the correct refraction whenever you are going to correct amblyopia the first step to make sure is that your refraction is correct the glass prescription is correct and always rule out organic causes so if uh, all these three are good then proceed with the amblyopia therapy the traditional uh, treatments that we have been following for many years include the occlusion penalization and the pedic has given us a lot of guidelines which we have been following for many years around definitely these are the gold standard in severe cases of amblyopia in very young children these are what we will be starting with initially so our new and latest modalities of amblyopia treatment are not going to replace patching or penalization especially in severe amblyopia this can be done in all cases of amblyopia whereas none of the newer therapies work in all cases of amblyopia 
so um, so these are certain things that you can advise the parents as what you can do while patching we need to make sure that the parents are following uh, the guidelines of pedic like uh, uh, four or six hours of patching for severe amblyopia four hours for moderate and what do they do so if you say six hours you may need to make sure that at least three hours of this are filled with near activity so how, what do you do during near activity parents usually do not have any idea so you need to give them certain um, uh, guidelines or you can make books uh, which can be distributed during the time of counseling in your clinics or hospitals or you can give uh, for uh, all the types of activities which the children can do for uh, challenging their near vision based upon their visual activity but the traditional therapy do have a lot of pitfalls like including poor adherence certain families they are not able to um, uh, do the traditional patching because as the children get older this problem comes in very young children i think patching would be the way to go especially in the like uh, initial stages you do you can do it but once the child becomes like 8 or 10 years old they do not have the time to do that 6 hours of patching per day so the decreasing compliance with will come when you have to do this therapy for years together especially with increasing age the uh, more school work that they have to do 6 hours they do not get any 6 hours once they come back from school at around uh, 6 o'clock then they go to tuition class then they have food and they go to sleep so there is no time for uh, like this duration of patching and it's definitely difficult there is a lot of psychosocial impact and stigma and in atropine you have light sensitivity sometimes very rarely there can be reverse amblyopia and systemic side effects if the parents do not follow the correct technique of apply application of atropine and always the problems of traditional therapy is it does not uh, address the pro true issue of amblyopia that is the binocular part of the amblyopia is not targeted in traditional therapy so you do not achieve actually a true e equalization after patching we do not have much studies on how many patients actually improve bsv and stereopsis we may have an improvement in the visual acuity but whether they really improve on the binocular vision and stereo is not really known it does not address suppression there is no simultaneous perception during the therapy at least and uh, amblyopia is not only a visual acuity loss uh, patching will target only visual acuity improvement it does not target the other issues which are associated with amblyopia including the perception binocular vision and eye teaming so amblyopia has a neurological basis there is a lot of the loss of binocular vision skills in these children they do not have adequate depth perception they have a lot of difficulty in scanning and tracking which you can make sure when you are making them to read the logmar chart they will not read the full chart fully they will skip a lot of words in between they have crowding phenomena contrast sensitivity is poor vision motor processing is difficult and they do have issues with peripheral vision so by patching we are not addressing any of these issues they have a lot of reading difficulties they cannot fuse at near double vision headache skips words and lines and words appear to swim these are all the problems which the parents tell poor tracking and poor processing but with the binocular uh, newer therapies we can address certain of these issues and uh, the brain the good part is the brain can change its form and function through neuroplasticity and there has been anecdotal reports of uh, having the vision lost in the good eye many years later even at, there are incidental reports at the age of 40 or 60 where patients lose vision completely in the good eye and then the amblyopic eye suddenly takes over so that was the reason why they had started that the, there is a plasticity extends beyond uh, and it is possible to revive uh, vision even in adult amblyopia so the newer concepts based on perceptual learning and dichoptic training where do you use the binocular vision training where both eyes work as a team and the goal is to break the suppression and uh, also with hand in hand they have improved reading ability better academic performance and better sports performance so the i think this may coincide with what dr murali and aruna probably have talked before so the newer um, amblyopia treatment may include the active uh, and passive and mainly includes the dichoptic and the perceptual based and these are uh, actually dichoptic means you are having presenting independent stimuli to either eye and you have to integrate it using a special glasses which is a red blue glasses so what you are basically doing is you are reducing the contrast in the good eye and you are trying to match it to that of the amblyopic eye the amblyopic eye has a 
um, slightly better uh, contrast and then the eyes are integrated and as the visual acuity improves automatically the games become more difficult and then the contrast sensitivity of the good eye is slightly increased with each game and then that uh, results in so in binocs what happens is first the stereopsis and the binocular vision improves and that results in the improvement in the visual acuity so that's how the improvement starts so unless that is why it doesn't work very well in severe amblopia whenever there is a dense suppression or there is a central suppression or there is a microtropia with central scotoma binox will not work because it cannot as a whatever programs are there currently it does not target central suppression at all whereas if you have a case where there is some gross stereopsis you have good binocular vision then in those cases you will get an improvement so the key here is to choose the correct case we cannot recruit every case and say that binox is not working when your inclusion criteria are very stringent then it shows an improvement so the games based on dichoptic principles are quite I think all these are available in the internet the degrash game I do not have personal experience with any of these um, the Tetris game the ATS based there are games like iBit so I'm not going to talk much about this because just taken from the internet I do not have personal experience with any of this vivid vision dichoptic movies and uh, there are intermittent occlusion glasses there is monitored adherence to patching which is available where you can actually see whether the parents are i mean the patients are compliant or not but we have been doing binox in uh, arvin coimbatore for about a year now with the new program the old program was done earlier and that we didn't get that good an effect and many patients dropped out during covid so here you have uh, computer vision uh, management. It is a cloud-based uh, technology as the, how the previous uh, speakers were um, mentioning. There is nothing that you need to install uh, in the computer. They just give you a password and uh, uh, once the patient recruits, they are given a password and then they can enter it. So currently what we are doing is we are following a hybrid mode where we are training the patients in our clinic and we are not entirely giving it to the Binox team. We are not handing over the patient to the Binox team because that way it didn't work for us. The problem is the patient comes every one month and in between the one month they do not, the compliance is very less because they have to do the game at least for five or six days a week. The problem what we were facing is the binox, the uh, optometrists of binox were not able to handle the load. They were recruiting a lot of patients and they were not able to give the sufficient time. So by the time we enrolled the patient in Aravin and by the time binox was seeing the patient, there was almost a 15 day gap between the two and uh, their appointments were not working. So we have set up an in-house uh, uh, binox clinic within our hospital and we are monitoring the patient more frequently. So now we have trained optometrists. So, uh, most of the work is done by our uh, people in um, like uh, Arvind so that we train the um, patient and the, the child and the parent we see whether they are able to do the program we call them for one or two sessions in the base hospital then we are, uh, make them do the therapy online and even the in between visits because whenever they give their visual acuity assessments it never used to correspond with the visual acuity improvements that we are uh, getting in the hospital the problem is they will do the online assessment and they will make the patient the patient will come forward so the distance will not be maintained so when the distance is not maintained all their logmar values does not match with what we were getting in the base hospital so we do the in, in between vision assessment everything is done by us instead of totally relying on the company so i think that will be a way instead of totally saying okay we have enrolled in binox now let us see after two months whether there is visual equity doesn't work like that so i think we need to have a more proactive approach towards it and uh, that's when we are seeing improvement in these cases so the patients have to play these games for 30 to 40 minutes Initial improvement can be seen in around two weeks and uh, you can expect a good improvement in appropriate cases if properly selected by eight weeks definitely. So this is the therapy, this is our Binox clinic. This is, uh, sister has been trained by Binox and she's uh, helping the patient uh, do the therapy 
in our clinic so only when we are satisfied that they are performing properly then we ask them to do it at home it is, it is not practical for the patients to come and visit us every day many of them are from far away and they will not be able to come and every day do one hour of their we also do not have the time to sit with them for one hour every day but we need to call them every week at least to see at least to see whether they have done the requisite number of sessions and we can open and see actually uh, when the patients log in we can actually see whether they are doing the sessions how well they have been doing and uh, all these things we can monitor and keep on close follow up so this is our experience around 21 patients we have uh, completed uh, from uh, last march and uh, the green is where most of them as you can see are anisometropic or ametropic amblyops See, in amyotropic, it is very good. We see a lot of cases where we have like vision improving to 612. High myopes, it may be like minus 8 with minus 3 cylinder, their vision will be 6 by 12. There is no way we can improve the vision with any technology. We cannot do bilateral patching or uh, it doesn't work. But this with binox, they get their improvement in uh, stereoacuity. The stereoacuity improves and the vision also improves. So it works best, I would say, for ametropic amblyopia, number one. Secondly, for anisometropic amblyopia. For strabismic amblyopia, it hardly works. Because most of the cases of strabismic have central suppression or they have 4 prism diopter test positive. Whenever 4 prism diopter is positive, my, uh, this binox will not work. And um, so even we have aligned uh, the strabismus cases, we have to align. Without alignment, we cannot try because it's a binocular therapy. Even uh, when the alignment is uh, like having around 2 or 3 prisms of vertical deviation, we have to give the prism and then only we have to do the pinox therapy. Even if we have to do following all these, still our cases have not improved. So I would say that this works in very select patients as of now, but when the selection criteria is followed, it works. So we had a total of 13 anisometropic amblyopes and all of them improved by 2 logmar lines, uh, about uh, 8 of them. Three of them improved by one, and there were no BC way improvement in two. And ametropic, uh, these numbers are very less currently, uh, but uh, these are the patients who have completed it successfully. But we have uh, this year, April, May, we have a lot of more recruits. And now we are offering as first line therapy also to younger patients whose parents want to try um, anisometropic and uh, ametropic amblyops. So, strabismic amblyop, uh, right now we can see in four cases only one has improved uh, by two logmar line, one has improved by one logmar line. So, another is the perceptual, uh, the Gabor patch based uh, uh, neurovision we have tried. So, the way I have tried is, I have tried in all the cases where Binox has failed in our scenario. We tried 10 patients like that, none of the patients improved even with perceptual learning. So, I think it is a basic thing in those cases whenever the amblyopia is severe it does not work with either of these programs so that is what i would like to say but it didn't did work in two cases of nystagmus so the cases where perceptual learning may be beneficial is like albinism with nystagmus or we have recruited few of stargas as per their company's suggestion but i don't know whether it will work or not is the it's still ongoing but it's extremely expensive. So that is another thing to remember. So the conclusion is we still, I think all these are in the nascent stages, all these binocular therapies, it's a very good start. They are in the nascent stages. There may be a lot of developments in the future. We may be needing to give, so we are giving our feedback to the Binox company. So now I'm telling them that you have to try to change your program for strabismic amblyop for it to work. Because the currently they are having the same program for any envelope for whether it is it is not varying based on diagnosis. It doesn't vary based upon whether it's a, an isometropic or ametropic or strabismic or sensory. Whereas it will not work like that. Their program has to differ based upon the etiology of amblyopia. That's when we may be able to see some result. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was a nice presentation. As Sandra was rightly telling, the enrolling the patient and the initial training part and this uh, reassessing and monitoring during the therapy is something very crucial and that should be taken by the hospital team rather than giving it to the software. And um, there are a lot of other unanswered questions like whether we can give a combination of these therapies if one fails going to the other and what is the duration when to assess the endpoint all this still remains and a lot to be explored 
Any questions for Dr. Sandra? I'm facing this case scenario, ma'am. So can you please guide me through this? So what is your experience on uh, treating uh, patients ten, uh, 1 to 10 years of age who have cylinders and you, they have a abnormal uh, topographical map? So their uh, optimal refractive outcome is only going to come once the user contact lens. The spectacle vision is not going to improve uh, astigmatism uh, related uh, amblyopia. So have you treated such cases? Because it's common in both eyes. They exhibit enantiomerism also. Uh, so, how would you go about it and do you have experience treating patients like this? In uh, frank keratoconus uh, related patients, I think I have not tried to, uh, to treat uh, amblyopia in uh, mm -hmm. patients with uh, severe keratoconus because as you rightly pointed out, there are a lot of other issues there, higher order aberrations and uh, quality of vision is really poor. Um, so then you may need to... Uh, you, uh, I have really, uh, it's, uh, we have not recruited any patient like that. But simple cylinder, it, where they do not have keratoconus, like even if it is a minus 3 cylinder or minus 4 cylinder, but where the topography is normal, you can try. Yes. It, uh, you, it is not necessary that you need to put them on contact lenses. Only if the, they have irregular astigmatism, then the contact lens will give a better visual acuity. But if it is a simple cylinder where the topography is normal, it is not a irregular astigmatism, then uh, glass prescription is good enough. No, but uh, it's a, it's a little mask, no, because them having an astigmatism, they will not get 6-6 six, six on wearing glasses. It'll be somewhere yeah, around exactly. Six, See, first time when you make them wear glasses, you should not start on any of the therapy. First time you put them on glasses, you review after a month, you see for improvement. And uh, once uh, you do not get improvement even after three months of wearing glasses, that's when you start on uh, either your traditional patching or any of these newer therapies. I send them for a contact lens trial, but the problem what I'm facing is I send them for a contact lens trial. I get a half a line or one line improvement, but they are not able to consistently wear the contact lens. Yeah, and they so will not be, most of the people in the down south are not too complacent with wearing contact lens, and especially in the uh, sub, sub uh, 10 years of age. So we, even in our practice, we do not uh, put most of the children on, uh, none of them are on contact lenses. Uh, in fact, unless they have like uh, keratoconus where they have use rose scale lenses or something like that, you know, scleral contact lens. like. So I'm I'm not understanding whether your patients are keratoconus patients or not keratoconus. Not, no ma'am, we cannot put it in the purview of keratoconus necessarily. Any astigmatism, if they have an abnormal topography, yeah. it's going to induce aberration. So the visual acuity is going to drop. So you can only rectify it once the keratometry is stabilized using a contact lens. So I'm, I'm just wanted to know if you have experience with putting contact lens for them and having putting lenses, will this binox therapy, you know? Probably it might, but then again in our scenario, we do not... Uh, I use contact lenses that much also. The other thing is whether uh, some patients, as uh, she was telling, they will not, uh, I mean, as you were telling, they were not good candidates for contact lens. They might wear it during the therapy. I have one patient like that. And then later they will go, to, only during the, therapy, the training session. After that, they will go back to the glasses. So the whole, all these are there. Uh, we have to see. Any, I think we have to take each on a case-by-case case basis. Yeah. We cannot put forth any generalizations no, because i'm i was because in as far as contact lens is concerned the rose lens tends to fall off because it sits on the cornea so scleral lenses you can you try some scleral so lenses common. yeah the problem is they're more expensive now. yeah yeah that is there that's, that's what i said for indian scenario we have to like I'm not see able how to like, strategize how to yeah when you're beginning any amblopia you leave all these difficult cases yeah find <laughs> the easy cases first <laughs> no, that, Regular amblyopia, you are having proper retinal image, but it is the brain that you are treating. In the case you mentioned, the quality of the retinal image, that Strom's conoid itself would not be a point focus, no? So yeah. I don't think uh, any of these therapies are going to improve that. No, but uh, because even in a corrected, I, I understand what you mean. Some four cylinder, three cylinder, 60 degree, 120 degree, whatever you do, six by 12, six by nine parts, only that much vision they will have. If putting a contact lens will recognize the camera. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, put, yeah, yeah. Wearing a contact lens yes. will be the better thing. Yes. But as uh, we, uh, but without contact lens, only glass and doing amblyotherapy is what you want to know, no? No, no, no. The, he's yeah. asking like instead of glasses, uh, whether we need to put a contact lens. Uh, yeah. Um, no, see if the topography is normal with cylinder, you can go for 
this therapy with glasses if topography is abnormal i do not recommend going for any of these therapies again the trial lenses are also not available for uh, higher uh, astigmatism and stuff if it is a simple cylinder as she was telling the trial lenses are available at much cheaper cost the trial they will have higher order operations that may yeah. not be addressed by this for customized lens i think cost effect is another issue yeah So, and yeah. for bilateral amatropy after wearing glasses what is the time frame you will call for the first follow up to look for improvement ma'am yeah you can call within uh, two months or so by the time whatever the best improvement has to come will come if you are finding an improvement after two months then again you call after one more month if you do not find any improvement after two months it is unlikely that provided they are wearing glasses full time yeah so if constant. the compliance is there are you sure, sure of the compliance then definitely you will get an improvement in two months yeah two months yes. yeah. so after two months again improvement is there if then the vision stays less uh, then you can definitely try, try for bilateral yeah thank you okay. thank you thank you thank you so much any other questions or like uh, it's done we can uh, complete